Welcome to tonight's virtual artist panel talk with the artists from Forever Becoming Young Phoenix Artists. I'm Lauren O'Connell, Curator of Contemporary Art. I'd like to invite all the artists to go ahead and turn on their screens and I'm going to introduce all of you. So um, the artists are Mia B. Adams, Marin Omoteo, Alaka Vincent Chung, Steffi Faircloth, Sam Fresquez, Estefania Gonzalez, Lena Klett, Cindy Mallory, Brianna Noble, Lily Reeves, and Pepe Solomon. So hi, everyone. <laughs> Before we begin to the audience, I want to ask you to go ahead and submit your questions at any time in the Q&A section. At the end, we will go ahead and answer some of those questions. So. Um, First of all, thank you all for being here and thank you so much to the artists for being part of this really wonderful exhibition. Um, I'd like to just start with a question for everyone uh, about the title of the exhibition, Forever Becoming. Although this is not a show based around one theme, I do feel that each of you had really unique responses to what Forever Becoming meant in relation to um, your own artistic practice and identity and or location. Um, would any of you be willing to share your thoughts on this? Please. Estefania. Hi. Yeah, so for me, Forever Becoming, I feel that things are always in a constant flux and shift and we always have to adjust to changes. And so for me, that's how I interpret the theme forever becoming is I feel like I'm always forever becoming into my practice and my work and the world in general. And I always have to adapt to those changes as well. Yeah. Sydney. To follow up on that, I agree with um, Estefania. Um, as much as I'm always changing as a person and the world's changing around us, I feel like my work is always changing and not just I grow as a person and my um, thoughts and concepts grow, but also um, my work itself, I like to recycle old projects into new projects. And I think that this also related to the current project that's in there as it's forever evolving into something new. Um, so it's a part of my process as well. Yeah, definitely. Brianna. Uh, the title to me felt like it's going to always be a present thought, uh, like forever becoming that matters to the younger me, to me now. And uh, I'm creating work that I want to see like in my 40s. Um, so it's any time of my life, I'm not just like, I know it all. I can't possibly know it all. I'm always trying to help myself um, with things I've done in the past and like trying to aid myself in the future. Um, so it's literally like, I'm a constant learner and always a student in that whole scenario. Yeah, and that makes me realize too, I think most of the people tuning in may have already <clears throat> read about the show or maybe seen the show, but if you haven't, this show features 11 artists under or near the age of 30 that are based out of Phoenix. So I think definitely this is a moment in their careers where they're emerging and their kind of, um, you know, artistic practices are always changing and they're challenging themselves. Um, they all make really powerful work. But I, I feel like Brianna, Brianna, you said, in my 40s and I was like oh but you're not 40 I hope no like she's not 40 <laughs> she's talking about her future self <laughs> Sorry. no no not at all does anybody else want to say anything to about forever becoming Lily I just I think that um for me personally um I see it as a very future oriented show um and I think that that's really exciting for me um you know, to be a part of this group of like young artists that are always sort of looking towards the future as a space of opportunity. Um, and I think that's what's great about this whole exhibition is like, even though, you know, we're making work in a time that sort of weighs you down over and over and over again, you know, it's um, 
the fact that we have an opportunity to like make a future that we want to see, you know, through our work or whatever, um, is sort of what kind of came out through me or like for me in this show. So. Yeah, I guess yeah, to ahead. jump in off where Lily left off is I feel like me and myself included and a lot of us use this time to create work as a way to process, you know, the world around us and process our experiences. Um, after a lot of time of reflection, especially after such tough past couple of years. So I definitely feel like, you know, we're envisioning our futures and taking this time to reflect on, you know, where we are, have been coming from. Great, thank you. I think also jumping in on that, um, for me, like the forever becoming sort of means there isn't an end point, like we're always gonna be continuing this process. And I think that's a really important part of everything. Like we don't have to stop, we're gonna keep going. In many ways, I think everyone should aspire to constantly be in the state of forever becoming. Um, Mia, go ahead. For me, forever becoming means like a constant state of transforming. Um, and I think that's really present within this show because we we made work before this show and we changed as people, we changed as artists and, you know, our practice has changed, you know, you know, parallel to that. So I think that this is a really good like timestamp of our work and who we are now and the things that we care about um, and kind of just like expressing that um, through this exhibition. Yeah, and it's important to note too that all of the artists in this exhibition um, made new works for the show, uh, not necessarily based on Forever Becoming, but based on their own practices and pushing them and challenging them um, forward. So, All right, well, do you guys mind if I jump into some questions for you or, yeah? Okay, so Vincent, I'd actually like to start with you. Um, the paintings that you make are very non-traditional. They use sewn canvas, oil, dirt, paint, and neon light to construct the surface. The materiality of your paintings and your process, um, they all incorporate elements of chance. And that seems to really play into this idea of forever becoming. Um, maybe you could tell us how you approach making new works without really fully understanding what the outcome will be. Good evening. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, most of my work kind of evolves naturally, uh, through the, uh, construction and deconstruction aspect. Um, construction is, would be, you know, the sewing and attaching certain, um, textiles together and a deconstruction form of it would be, you know, individual pieces painted, you know, whether it's in a day or two days or within the span of like two weeks or something like that. So um, hopefully that kind of answers your question there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think I'll also mention too that um, the materials that you use like oil and dirt, um, the oil itself, when you put it on the canvas or the raw linen, it absorbs in a way that you have no control over. So um, that to me is really fascinating in terms of like how the outcome is so unknown. Um, you can control it in some ways, but then again, you you are looking for those moments to kind of like be part of the, the formation of the work, so. Mm -hmm. So, and then, Vince, um, not Vincent, um, Pepe, for you, your hyper-realistic portraits um, have the opposite. They're very intentional and they have a very distinct style that often has a solid color behind um, in the background and then focusing instead on the details of the, the, um, the I don't, never know the word to use, the individual's face, face and clothing. Um, their attire actually seems very intentional and I think that it is very intentional. Can you speak to how you use um, uh, the, 
their clothing and the, the things that you adorn their bodies with to tell the story of them, in particular, Bright and Timba, who is portrayed twice here? Most definitely, and uh, good evening to everyone. Um, so my, my work and uh, pieces start with um, a conversation, a simple conversation between myself and the sitter. And um, oftentimes that conversation is, you know, taken and then transferred to the studio. Um, and I record these conversations that I have with my sitters. And uh, during these conversations, they tell me things about them, um, you know, about colors that they like, for instance, their experiences. Um, and then while I'm in the studio, um, I reflect back on those conversations and kind of pick out the things that um, help support and help paint them um, in, in their fullest essence. Um, if that answers the question. Yeah, so do you, I, somebody actually asked me this the other day, do you pick out the, the, I know sometimes it's fabric or patterns or the, what they wear, do you, do you source that and pick it out or how do you go about doing that? Uh, sometimes. So, uh, when I first started thinking about my work, uh, in a serious way in 2017, um, I started with, you know, going into my mom's closet and, and taking her fabric and, um, you know, putting that fabric into my work. Um, eventually, and with this, specifically uh, Timba's uh, portrait, uh, when we met, I, um, I told him to pick out something to bring. And specifically, I wanted him to, to keep in mind that he should pick something that he wants to be seen in 100 years from now. Um, so that's what he came up with. And the only thing that I controlled is the head wrap um, in this situation. Which is, which is uh, what it's a space blanket that's used in, for emergencies, right? Yes, that's the only thing I had control over. Everything else, you know, I allowed him to uh, tell us you know, how we want him to be seen in the long run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, and then Brianna, um, in contrast, the figures representing your paintings are yourself and the architecture that surrounds you is equally important to the figures. <clears throat> the two paintings, the blinds wide open, which is on the left and um, the rules in my house, which is on the right, have very different settings. One is situated in, reality and the other is in this kind of alternate universe. Um, can you tell us what is the conversation, do you feel the conversation that's taking place between these two works? Yeah, um, well, first I, oh, like, hello, uh, but I hardly ever use um, an actual setting. And so having a setting like the rooms, um, for me, was to build in safety for myself. Uh, and then the conversations the two paintings are having are what my day today could look like. Um, and so on the left, I'm just drinking water, uh, just thinking, probably not thinking, just gulping and breathing. Whereas the other ones, it's like a whole party is happening. And if I could have my way with a building setting and my surroundings, this is how lavish my surroundings would be. Um, so it's not necessarily that one's real and one's not. It's just different time, maybe. Uh, the one on the left is uh, more so a quick moment that happens all the time. I'm always just stopping and drinking water and stopping to contemplate, whereas that seems like, oh yeah, everyone does that. Whereas the other ones are, this is relaxing and this is not a space for everyone. And it's again, a safety net that I've placed around myself. Uh, so the conversation they're having is, it's like, what are you doing over here? Well, okay, I'm doing this over here. And it's all easy and it's not really complex, even though, they can seem that way, especially the further you look into things, you see all the little details. Um, it's just really nice moments I'm having to myself. 
I wonder, I have to say too, though, I think that the works are definitely also having a conversation about control and power, um, the way that you, you know, in one of the blinds wide open, like you said, you're just drinking water, it's an everyday thing, but you're really situating the viewer on the outside looking in. Um, and then for in the, ru the rules in my house, I mean, like even the title in and of itself is like, like you're coming into my space, this is how it is, you've duplicated yourself. So there's like more than one of you and um, the way that you are just very, very, you're looking straight at the viewer. So to me, they're, the converse, they're having conversations with each other, but it's very much about this idea of <clears throat> control and, and like power hierarchy and stuff, so. Oh yeah, definitely. Whether or not you're welcomed into the space is definitely. Right. Okay. So then, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that brings me to um, a few works. Um, so there, there are a few works in this exhibition that also talk about power, but that also use or reference hair to speak about societal pressures and trauma that women face today. But there's also, but the two specifically that stand out to me, um, in the fact that they are acts of reclaiming power are Marin's lead with your looks and Mia's um, unruly. So maybe Marin, you could start. Um, I think although both of the works stem from personal experiences, they're also something that many women can relate to. So I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about the works and tell us what messages you hope to be sharing. Marin, we can start with you. All right. Hey, everyone. Can't see. Um, yeah, so with my work, um, this work in particular, this new body of work I've been working on are these beaded tapestries using um, synthetic braided hair and then pony beads, which are, which are just a type of hair beads that you find on, um, you wear in your hair. And so, you know, speaking towards the reclamation of power, I was using this phrase in the work, lead with your looks, as kind of this way to, you know, reclaim your, like, bodily autonomy and to reclaim this power that, you know, often a lot of women face, you know, that we're not, <laughs> it's kind of like, I guess the problem that I feel like we face are being put in these in situations and feeling like we have to kind of minimize um, ourselves, um, especially like as a black woman being seen or feeling like hyper or not hyper seen, but being visible can in white you know, spaces can often feel like, um, I don't know, you're not, you aren't given Sorry guys, having a hard time finding any words, but you're kind of, you're not like, it's it's like you don't have the right to claim your space. And so it's kind of about claiming that space and really owning yourself and your body. And so I kind of was using also these materials like braided hair and pony beads as almost like an extension of my body. And you know, the braided hair I use is from the beauty supply store and it's from the same color hair that I would use to do my own hair. And um, I'm thinking a lot about the process of these materials, you know, braided hair um, has this, you know, name protective styles. And so protective styles are used to protect the structurally fragile nature of, you know, black hair. And I was also referencing um, beaded crowns within Yoruba cultures because I'm half um, Nigerian and so within Yoruba cultures, there are these beaded crowns that are also used to kind of protect like your soul and you would use them for guidance. And so kind of making these historic references to forms of protection um, to talk about ways that we choose to protect ourselves and kind of reclaim that protection for ourselves. And I can also, you know, talk a lot about the patterns and the colors in the work. The patterns are, you know, reminiscent of these childhood objects, the hair breadths, I used them in my childhood, the pony beads, I used them in my hair in my childhood. And then the colors are intentionally, you know, these bright colors as I've always been interested in the way that patterns can 
um, patterns within textiles can draw us in and tell this narrative. Um, and that's kind of something I've used a lot of times in my work because um, in a lot of, you know, Afri like West African patterns, there's a lot of, you know, motifs used to tell stories. And so um, I'm kind of, you know, making these connections in my brain as I'm using these materials. Um, and I'm trying to think what else. <laughs> I kind of covered a lot, but I mean, yeah, in essence, it's serving in a lot of ways as, you know, a reclamation of power for myself. And another point that I wanted to talk about is using the pony beads and the barrettes and these kind of playful childlike materials is almost as a way to kind of reconnect with that childlike innocence. And you kind of crave that when you're in the face of like trauma and grief and you're going through these stages of vulnerability you kind of like crave this sense of like oh i wish i could you know find that child that child inside of me again because that's the only other time in your life where you know you are so vulnerable to the world and you feel that vulnerability again when you are often faced with trauma and um, so that's kind of the intention and the layers behind the work for me. And so, um, yeah, so I kind of, yeah, I hope that answers <laughs> the question. And kind oh, of that was, that was great. And I'm actually really glad that you brought up the connection to childhood with the pony beads and the barrettes, because I know for Mia too, it's connected to her childhood as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Mia. <laughs> Um, let's go ahead and see, I think. Mia, you're on mute. Sorry about that. <laughs> so with this piece, I really wanted to dive deep into myself and my experiences. And um, my hair is a really huge part of my identity. And growing up, I really struggled with who I was and my natural features being a black and Mexican woman. Um, and I often use straighteners to uh, conceal that natural, you know, part of myself. And when I was younger, I used to beg my mom to let me straighten my hair because I, I felt so engulfed in this Eurocentric, you know, white beauty standards um, as far as like beauty goes. and I, I fell victim to that and I really struggled with self-confidence, but as I got older, I became really more, uh, I became more accepting of myself um, and really feeling empowered in who I am and my identity and being a black and Mexican woman and really just like owning myself wholeheartedly. So this, this piece is reflecting on my childhood and how I used to use the straightener as a tool to you know, basically like reject my blackness and try to fit into these white beauty standards. And the pile is, is supposed to represent uh, the, how it's kind of like an invalid item for me now. It's something that once hold a place in my life and held a purpose in my life, but it no longer, it no longer serves me anymore. And I feel like this is a experience that a lot of other black women go through um, growing up in certain communities and a lot of people joined, you know, like the natural hair movement, that was a really big thing uh, within our community. And I feel like there will be some people who, you know, might look at this pile and be like, okay, I get it. You know, like there's a straightener, you know, at the bottom of my bathroom that I don't use anymore, you know, because some people, you know, they come to that point where there are certain things that they use and they just, they don't hold any purpose in their life anymore. And this is kind of what this piece is to me. Thanks, Mia. Yeah. Yeah, it's like it's like a protest. I always I think yeah. we talked about it. <laughs> yeah. Um so um Steffi, I'm gonna turn the question over a question over to you. The two ASMR videos and the performance ephemera that you have in the show are part of your Border Town ASMR works or series. Um, you said that your work speaks to nostalgia and I, I'm assuming it's spe specifically about growing up in a border town, but also challenging uh, societal gender norms. 
Can you tell us how does your artwork and also being an ASMR performer play into these notions of nostalgia and um, challenging the norms? By the way, Julie's gonna pull up. This is a, a, a still from one of your videos. So if you wanna talk about a different work, <laughs> she can pull up a different no, no, no. image. That works, that works. Um, yeah, well, and I will say too, this is, this is about hair as well, right? It is, yeah, so funny. Um, so yeah, this piece <laughs> is, um, the viewer is um, getting their hair cut essentially. Um, so, and I'm the hairstylist. I'm um, performing as a hairstylist in this particular video. And um, so I think um, I was thinking about ASMR a lot in terms of how people usually view it, which is through YouTube and in like a private setting. And I think YouTube has always been, when I was thinking about how I was gonna disseminate this work initially, I was thinking what would be the successful way to do this. And of course I was like, okay, I'm gonna have to try to fit in with these other um, ASMR YouTubers. I'm gonna try to um, uh, kind of interact with them too. Um, and the thing with YouTube, I don't know if I've like mentioned this in the past, but I do, YouTube almost comes into play as well in terms of my childhood. Like I did grow up, you know, being kind of on the border of like Gen Z and millennial. I did, there was a time in my life where I grew up with the internet, um, but there's also a time in my life where I didn't. Um, but the time where I did grow up with the internet, I was super drawn to YouTube. Um, and that I've noticed in this, as we've uh, had more social media platforms come into play, um, YouTube is the one where I've definitely, for some reason, been able to capture people's attention best. Um, even as like a kid before like kid YouTube was a thing. Um, and um, so I think in that way, I probably haven't discussed that before, but I think it would be good to bring up. And then uh, I'm trying to think if there was another part of that question that I'm missing, Lauren. Um, well, I think, I think you covered a bit of it. Maybe you could talk. I mean, I feel, I feel like I do want to tell the audience that we've talked about a lot of works that you can see visually on the screen. They're better in person, of course, but then mm -hmm. works like Steffi's work and um, Sam's work and Estefania's work um, and Lily's work that are like actual experiential things. It is so much about, for your work, Steffi, about listening and hearing. So we see these exactly. images and they look attractive, but the thing that draws you in most is the sound. So maybe you could just talk to us about why ASMR um, was something that you wanted to engage with. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so um, I kind of noticed I a lot of my work um, is about popular culture and in this case, a viral internet culture. And um, there was just kind of a shift in 2018, 2019, I noticed that um, ASMR had been around for a while, but suddenly it was um, just super saturated everywhere. Like you were seeing like celebrities do advertisements on TV and it kind of occurred to me, oh, you can really make ASMR about anything. And like, no matter what your personal experience is, people will find a way to relate to it because of you're incorporating these sounds like that draw people in and these like visual, basically visual elements that draw people in. So you're getting people to kind of connect with you that you usually and interact with you in a way that you would never. Um, but so I was like, okay, how do I, what would it look like to make ASMR about my um, border town experiences? And how do I, like, what is, it almost had to make me think, what is so satisfying? Like, people don't really think of living in a border town as satisfying. So I was like, okay, what is so satisfying about living in a border town? And like, what can I bring? Um, and um, yeah, so Thassos, which is in the still, that's, um, it's also known as pogs. 
Um, a lot of my work deals with kind of mundaneness and niche subjects, but that are also relatable to other communities as well. Um, so these are basically collectible items, um, but you, uh, also a game that would be played in my grade school courtyard. And I remember it was specifically, um, I would only ever see boys playing the game. And so I just distinctly remember, like when I was thinking, okay, what ASMR, what is, what is one of the new ASMR works I was gonna do? I just like, I don't know what triggered that memory, but I just heard like the clashing of metal hitting the concrete. Um, and I think it also just really came into play like with the overall theme in my work. And um, yeah, it was something I always wanted to play as a kid, but it was definitely always a boys game. And or that's how I saw it. That's how people in my school saw it. Um, and yeah. Thanks, Stephanie. Yeah, of course. So, <clears throat> excuse me, right when I turned my microphone on. Sam, you also have a video work in this, um, in this exhibition. And, and it's actually a really new work for you that we've talked about that you think you might be doing a series based on it, which is really exciting. But the work's called The Meat Cute, and it's also very performative. And it also challenges um, not only societal gender norms, but, <clears throat> but also it skews the lighthearted, heteronormative um, narratives of romantic comedies, that uh, romantic comedy movies. And really, it feels like you're doing it to also kind of center queer love. Um, so by inserting yourself in the male love interest role, it's hard because if people haven't seen it, I want to make sure they know what's going on. Um, you're inserting yourself as the male love interest in these iconic films and clips. Um, and by doing that, it's actually so endearing and powerful. Uh, I find that people sit down and they like, they're like, oh, I know this movie and they laugh. And then, and then there's something by inserting yourself and everything's just so comfortable and normal. Um, it's really lovely to see. So can you tell us a little bit about what your inspiration for this work was? Yeah, it was really interesting actually. Um, I was doing this thing during the pandemic with a friend of mine and we called it the queer movie night. And so once a week, um, every week we would over Skype watch a queer movie together and I had never really gotten into queer film. And I feel like I started to notice that there were so many tropes that had to do with like, trauma and I don't know, just like huge amounts of suffering and I, not to say that that's not a part of queerness, but um, I grew up really, really into rom-coms. And so, I don't know, I, I feel like that's what I was really looking for in these queer films, because they're about, like at the end of the day, they're about love, but a lot of them weren't ever focusing on the actual relationships. Um, and so, I don't know. I also thought a lot about how rom-coms were such a huge part of my childhood and the way that I was talking about relationships to so many of the people that I grew up around, like my parents, my friends, my family, um, it really centered around TV, around movies, um, and usually around rom-coms. And so it felt like this nice, I don't know, I guess like other people said, like this thing for a past self, like for <laughs> childhood <laughs> Sam, for like 11 year old Sam who <laughs> didn't have these movies that I would have existed in. Um, yeah. I feel as though, um, you know, when people watch romantic comedies, it's a, it's kind of like a way to escape. They're not really heavy. They're very, like we said, lighthearted, but also, um, you know, this has come into conversation a lot where oftentimes the actors are white and they're heterosexual, which really only creates space for a very specific group of people in this world. Um, so, you know, whenever one watches a rom-com, I think that whether they want to or not, they, they, I, they try to like and see themselves as, as the person being swept off their feet. So by doing this, I think you've really allowed a, a larger group of people to participate in that enjoyment. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's it's interesting how many <laughs> how rom coms don't represent at all what relationships look like. Um, oh no. Those people. So yeah. Yeah, and to be honest, not even in white heterosexual relationships, they're not very yeah. realistic either. So what were you gonna say? I was just gonna say, and just like conversations like we've had just in our friend groups about, you know, queer film is like it does, you know, there is a lot of trauma in it. And we just want like we just want like a normal <laughs> like love story rom com where like the tr like the problem isn't that someone's coming out yeah. which like these are real problems but like yeah. it would just be nice to like have that yeah is that you were constantly seeing it yeah I know it's like starting to be from. a thing with like newer film but I mean we'll never have that growing up or we'll never have those um so it felt like a good way of doing that I don't know yeah absolutely thanks Cam um, so Sydney, I'm going to uh, turn to you now. I want to ask you about your series, Six Evolve. And it's funny because when you were talking about Forever Becoming um, and your work is literally constantly evolving in this series. <clears throat> so the work itself uses the same six wood posts in each iteration, and it has beautiful formal qualities. But I also know that the posts are representational. Can you tell us what they mean to you and also about how your like work evolves with each installation? Yes, I can. Hello, everyone. Um, so these six four by fours um, have turned into like kind of family to me. Um, and it's funny because the first iteration that I used them as I was really thinking about my family. Um, it started in a formal way and often with my process, it often does. I, I think about the formal qualities of the work. Um, so the way that I had them laid up um, against the wall in the corner was just really thinking about them formally, thinking about balance and space and all of that. Um, but then I started to recognize the number six, there's six members in my family. And I just wanted to speak about the kind of interconnectedness. So the first one was also they were set up in a, a way that they were kind of woven in between one another and thinking about how a family is woven together, but also wanting to keep it broad for a community, um, thinking about um, different communities, different environments, whether that's like cohorts at work or school, um, but the interconnectedness between the individuals within that. So using t-shirt rope um, to bring in the body, but also to, to draw those connections between the individuals and really seeing these four by fours as individuals. Um, and it's just kind of have grown um, based on the, the spaces I'm invited to show in. So it's often um, when it comes to a new space that I get to show in, I think about what is happening in my life itself or what is happening in the world. Um, on a more worldly level than a more personal one. So I've shown it in ways in that these six represent like uh, really thinking of it on a personal level of like representing families. So showing them where they're in the same room, but separated. So this longing to wanting to be with um, uh, your, your main group. Um, but also in ways of thinking about like I, my grandfather had passed away. So thinking of this as um, individuals of a generation uh, and that falling of a generation, but playing with um, balance in it. So one thing with all of my work that I'm really interested in is balance and really trying to push the limits of um, these materials and restricting it to usually t-shirt yarn, t-shirt rope, um, and the four by fours themselves. So with that one, I they were all dependent on one another um, in, a, in a way that was balanced. So they were counterweighting one another. They were leaning forward. Um, with this one, I really started to think about what has been going on, especially within COVID and ar around the Black Lives Matter um, protest and movement. I'm really interested in the way that all of these bodies came together to really um, support one another, but also to act as a barrier um, as a protectant for one another. So with this piece, I wanted to like pull it off the wall and out of the corner. And I really wanted it to like 
be present in the space and be reliant only on itself um, to really speak to what was happening in those spaces and what I saw in the images of those protests and such. Thanks, Sydney, that was great. So um, it's interesting that you talk about the protest and definitely Black Lives Matters and the COVID period and all of the trauma that we've been experiencing um, over the past year and a half and obviously much longer, um, but was heightened recently. So healing seems to be a main topic um, in both Lily's installation, Room to Breathe, uh, which focuses on healing the mind and the body through meditation. And then Estefania's two channel projection, uh, Witsu Pochli, which talks about healing both land and humanity. I noticed that there's both of you have um, like reveal a process in your work for healing. Um, Lily, it's through, you know, a process of guided meditation. And Estefania, it's a process of like cleansing uh, and cleaning the land and the spirit. Um, could you each talk to us a little bit about those processes and the importance that it has in your work and what you're trying to share with your audience? Stephanie? Who wants to go first? <laughs> I, could, I mean, I could go first. Right. Um, yeah, so, you know, for me, um, I um, deal with a, a pretty, pretty bad anxiety disorder that I've had since childhood. And um, I think a lot of times in my work, you know, I, I try and find ways um, to sort of move through the world in a way that I um, that I need um, in life. I think that a lot of times, you know, um, we're sort of separated from things that um, make us peaceful just by default, you know, like a relationship to the land or, um, or our bodies or um, each other, you know, um, and, and so that's always been something I've tried to investigate in my work is um, finding these moments that bring, you know, me peace and hopefully also sort of extend that to other people um, as tools that they can use as, as well, um, you know, and I think, um, yeah, I think that that's mostly what I do in my work. <laughs> Um, is just always trying to find those moments of how how to sort of slow down and 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 two you know I think in the past two years of the pandemic and all of the craziness that we've seen um, you know in bar in the sort of environmental degra degradation and sort of societal issues um, you know I I was working it was it was something that I, I was working with a few activist groups the past like couple years and. Um, you know, just like dealing with the weight of all of this, like everything that's happening in the world, you know, on top of like what's going on in like my own head, you know, and, and I was speaking with, with um, a friend of mine, Wensler Noisy, who's a, um, a part of the, who founded the Apache Stronghold in Phoenix. And, and he was, you know, telling me that all of these people come, you know, to help them and myself included, you know, and um, he's like, all these people come here and um, you know, a lot of times like nothing gets done because like they're coming here from everywhere and, um, uh, you know, they don't know where they're coming from um, and they don't know where they stand like on a lot of these issues. And, um, you know, he was saying that like in order to like sort of meet everyone on the same page, um, you really have to sort of do the inner work um, for yourself to come from a place, you know, of um, of understanding and um, in order to be, you know, a good relation to other people, like you have to be good to yourself as well. Um, and that really resonated with me um, this past year in thinking about sort of like how I move through the world and the things that I wanna see, you know, or I hope to see happen um, and how like all of that really starts sort of like inside of you first. Um, before you can kind of like come out and help anyone or do anything in any sort of relationship. Um, so for me, that's what this piece was about. You know, it was very personal. It was made with my family and my partner um, and a ton of 
amazing, talented friends. Um, you know, as, as a way to sort of give everyone a moment to sort of individually um, have that sort of moment of um, like inner, uh, you know, inner, like going into yourself and sort of looking at yourself, um, even if it's for like 15 minutes, you know? Um, so yeah. Thanks, <laughs> Stephanie. Lauren, could you rephrase the question again or repeat the question? <laughs> I was on mute. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I was just wondering if you could talk about, um, so specifically in your work uh, in the, the two channel video, you know, you cleanse um, the spirit through burning of sage and you go through these rituals and then you also, to me, what was really profound is at the border wall, you're sweeping the sweeping the dirt away from the border wall. Um, and we spoke one time and you talked about it as like preparing the space for healing. So um, I was just wondering if you could talk about the importance of that process in your work. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I resonated a lot with what a lot of uh, points that Lily was bringing up. But for me personally, there is a lot of historical references that are coming in. So the first thing is that I grew up Catholic. And so ritual has been something that was a big part of my life. Uh, and I no longer, I'm no longer practicing uh, Catholic, but a lot of that sense of ritual stayed with me. And so for me, ritual is really a way for me to connect with myself and also the planet and trying to understand who I am as a human being. And when it came to the border wall, it really felt like it, there's this purging that needs to happen of the traumas that surround that surround the land and the construction of the border wall and all of the rippling effects that uh, that are made by all of these things. And so for me, the sweeping was also tied to ancient Aztec practices uh, that were tied to sweeping as a way to prepare a space before rituals and ritualistic practices. And so that was also a way for me to tie in my own practices as well. Growing up in Mexico, sweeping is something that you do every single day. The, it's very dusty, just like here in the desert as well. Like there's just a lot of dust. And so sweeping was a way for me to, um, to bring it to the border wall and also give it and also have that performative action be as a way to uh, cleanse the space, but also prepare the space to then go into the land to be able to cleanse my body and be able to connect with the land through meditation. Great, thank you. <laughs> okay, and so my last question is for Lena. Um, Lena, your drawings and sculptural altars and objects are so formally appealing. Um, the way that you can take like a tiny twig and elevate it to and make it art by highlighting its form with like beads or dipping it partially in paint, but you're really pulling things from nature um, to have these conversations. But what many people don't realize is that there's actually a really complex conceptual aspect to your work. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us about the ideas and the objects at the foundation of this work, specifically the photograph of the um, rock on Amazon and the 3D log and how you use that to translate into these objects and drawings. Hi, hey, yeah. Um, so <laughs> all of the objects and the drawings are based on um, some some objects that I found online um, of things in the natural world. So like you're saying, Lauren, there's a like a, a rock that was a photograph. It was for sale on Amazon, and it was just like a piece of limestone. Um, 
And then there was a 3D scan of a log from Sketchpad, which is like a website where people scan objects or they make 3D objects and upload them for a variety of purposes. Some are for like gaming purposes, some are for um, like educational purposes, some is just I think for the fun of it. Um, but all of these objects have existed in the real world at some point. But then there's like a process of removal that happens when they're scanned or photographed and uploaded. And all I have access to it is the digital version. Um, and I have a lot of like climate anxiety um, and I care very deeply about what we're doing to the planet as like a Western society. Um, and so I think part of my interest in these objects is that they're, they're objects that are either commercialized or sort of like commodified in some way. And they're sort of now an idea of an object that is technically like for sale or for use in some obscure purpose. Uh, and I think what I would like to do is to just try to um, have people think about them differently, right? So like if you can take something like a rock or a stick and consider it in a different light, um, then maybe you can start to value the world a little bit differently and maybe we can start to like break away from commodification of things. Um, and so that's kind of what all of this work is attempting to explore is the idea of transformation um, of an object and, and transformation in order to to re-see or reconsider it. That was great. Thank you, Lena. And it this is, I have to say, this is really hard. There are 11 of you and I feel like we've only touched on each of your works and I keep wanting every time you guys finish talking I keep wanting to like push deeper and talk more about each thing so um but unfortunately we don't have much more time so we're gonna have to go to Q&A um so I'm gonna pull up the questions and let's see what we have So um, we have a question for Vincent. It says, when did you decide to start incorporating sewing into your work and why? Um, sewing is kind of comes from, uh, it's an homage to like my parents. Uh, when my mom kind of first came to the States, um, she was a seamstress. And uh, all the, you know, stereotypical things you always hear, you know, about Asians working in factories and things like that. For my family, that was pretty much true. Um, and I think, you know, growing up poor and, and understanding poverty at a young age, um, my mom would always take us to uh, the factory when after school where, where we couldn't really afford anything after school, right? Like after school programs and things like that. And so I was always helping her around factories, uh, you know, loading dresses, loading up the thread machine um, and, um, you know, keeping stations moving. So sewing is an homage to, 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 to my mom uh, and kind of incorporating that into my work is my way of uh, bringing her her story into my stories, um, and then the uh, it, it's 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 hard to depict in in photos uh, until you're kind of up close um, to really realize that there's a lot of uh, sewn textiles together, because oftentimes you're kind of just drawn from the light, and um, which is why the uh, the neon pictures are mostly uh, juxtapositions to um, labor in this age of instant gratification. And so that's something to kind of draw my audience or my viewers to uh, go up close and, and actually take a look at, you know, how things are made and, and um, you know, try to understand the process. Thanks, Vince. All right, next question says, 
There has been much talk about trauma. There is no lack of it in the world. As artists and also art viewers, what or how is the making versus the viewing of art that deals with trauma affect you in terms of hopefully getting towards a catharsis? It's a big question. Does anyone wanna take a stab at it? That's a, that's a really great question. Uh, I think for me, it really is about the process of making is also the process of, of healing and processing the traumas that are happening in the world. It's all really, really hard. Uh, and I think we can all relate to that in some way, shape or form. And for me, it, the work, I hope to, I hope that the viewer can, can empathize with at least one major thing that's happening in the world that's really traumatic. And so that for me would be the difference is if I can have the viewer empathize with the work or connect to it with the work and think about it, uh, then they can start to think of ways of how they themselves can heal because healing is also something that's really personal. It's And collectively, I don't know how that is going to happen, how um, I don't have the answer to that. And so for me, it, it really is about how can I at least uh, have the viewer feel some type of empathy to then start to think about their own healing process. Mm. Absolutely. Does anyone else want to speak to that or should we go on to the next question? Um, I agree with uh, Stephania on that. And I to also work through trauma and thoughts um, in my own work, um, kind of getting myself into a stage where I can really just like sit and reflect and kind of push through the work. Um, and then oftentimes I'll create a piece and have to like maybe step away from it or sit back before I can really come in and kind of see I guess maybe the work I've done for myself as well. Um, but sometimes a piece, um, once I finish it, I have to give it a moment before I can really start to reflect on it. Um, and in viewing others work, I think there's a sense of, um, of like togetherness in that when you see a piece and you can start to feel and understand and empathize with the trauma that you see in the piece or that the piece is relating, um, there's something beautiful for myself in that, that it, that I'm not alone in experiencing these things or thinking these things. So I think there's um, a beautiful and something beautiful in sharing this um, and a collectedness within it um, that we can share these traumas and speak to them and um, show people that they're not alone in this world mm -hmm. and thinking, feeling, or moving through these things. Yeah, absolutely. All right, um, I'm gonna move on to another question. This one is for Sam. It says, as an intermedia artist, which, which of your personal projects or body of work are you most energized by and why? But for me, she, the continued of the question is, how did you select the films? And I think that would be a great question to answer in relation to this talk. Um, okay. So how I selected the films, um, yeah, the piece is called The Meat Cute. So um, I guess for those of you who don't know, uh, The Meat Cute is where the two main characters meet. And so my process for sort of figuring out what movies I wanted to use was sort of going through all of the movies that I were sort of pillars for me and what specific Meat Cute scenes stood out to me. Um, Cause that's something that's like really iconic and specific to rom-coms. Um, so yeah, yeah. And then what was the first part of the question? Um, I think it was asking what, as an intermedia artist, like what body of work are you most energized by? Oh, um, I mean, I feel like a lot of it is sort of what I'm dealing with now as a person. And that's how I'm, I'm figuring out what projects I want to be working on. Um, is what's specific to my life right now. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Cool. All right, so I'm going to just read one more question and then we'll finish up. Um, the question is, 
what do you, the artist in the show, feel that the Arizona art scene is becoming in the wake of the pandemic? You also don't have to have the answer. Yeah, it's okay. I think that um, we're we're trying to bring it back to life. Mm -hmm. um, back in school, I mean, there were you know, I had a lot of conversations with uh, classmates and um, a lot of people that I that I kind of watch go through school would oftentimes get up and leave once school is done, right? Because um, young artists especially weren't given the opportunity to really um, do what they needed to do um, to elevate um, the art scene. Um, but now, um, and this show is a, a perfect example of that, um, the voice is, is, is becoming to appear and um, hopefully it continues and uh, we're gonna bring it back to life. Hopefully yeah. that answers the question. You guys are only like, you are an amazing group of artists, but I have to say, you're only a, a sampling of the amazing artists here in Phoenix and Arizona. So um, one of the things that's so interesting to me about this group is that so many of you came to ASU, either you know you lived here or you moved away and came back or you came here, you never lived here and you went to ASU and then you stayed um, for the community, for the conversations happening here. So I think that speaks a lot to um, what our community has to offer. Well, I just want to thank all of you so much. Again, I feel like we should have just done individual talks with each of you, which would have allowed us to get deeper, but hopefully for our audience, this provided um, some insight into their work and please do come see the show. It is up at the Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art until January 23rd and that's it. So thank you all so much. Have a great night. Bye. Thank you. Night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>